Hello, just a few little technical issues to start with. If anybody is here, can you please comment in the chat? Obviously, I've had to move a live stream because it wouldn't let me access the uh, original stream I was going to run. So just need to know if anybody is here on the new stream. If so, please say something in the chat. Obviously, there's also a few seconds delay between the two. It does say we've got three people watching. But can you hear me? Oh, great. Well, Michael's here and Michael could hear me. And good evening to John as well. Um, yeah, sorry, obviously this is the first proper real live one we're doing. So the technology being shared amongst the three of us is causing a few little hiccups we need to sort out. Um, hi to uh, Graham and to Gary. Um, yeah, great. You're just tuning in to see if it's a complete car crash, I'm sure. Well, which it might well be. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, welcome to my isolation room where I've spent probably, oh, I don't know now how many weeks, uh, apart from my little stay in hospital. Uh, I've been here since, um, I guess, some middle of March. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to actually be able to sit at a computer again after a couple of months where I couldn't even work at a computer. Um, but anyway, it looks like everything is working, so we will get started. Um, basically, we're going to put a few different sorts of videos up in our channel. Some of them will be live streams and some of them will be just pre-recorded. Um, it won't just be myself, there will also be uh, Dimitri and Steve who are in the chat channel at the moment, uh, uploading content as well. Um, some of it will be... Um, behind the scenes shots from um, our shoots. I think there's a, a behind the scenes from our winter fashion shoot already up on the channel. Um, and sometimes it will just be a case of me just sitting here editing my pictures uh, on live streaming. Um, I used to live stream when I was uh, on Twitch. Uh, but the trouble with Twitch is that it's uh, very transient. After a few weeks, they actually remove a video, uh, which is fair enough, you know, and they are, you know, a bit tedious because it's just somebody sitting there editing pics. But uh, having said that, um, if you get not if you do subscribe and then get a notification that I am online and editing, please come on. Um, it's nice to have somebody to chat to while I'm busy uh, clicking away uh, editing photos once we can get out there and start taking images again. Um, and I'm always open to suggestions on what people think and how I should do something a bit different. Um, but we'll be doing various different um, techniques and uh, um, various other different practical exercises on there as well. So from some of our group shoots, um, there'll be um, a session on um, some ideas on how to process the images afterwards, as well as the uh, help when you're actually out taking the shots in the studio. Once we get back in the studios, whenever that might be. Um, talking about which, uh, I know the government are saying that studios can open from the 15th of June. Um, we won't be opening from the 15th of June. Um, it's still a bit too early for myself and Steve to get back in there. And while it should be possible to shoot one-on-one, -on -one, it definitely isn't suitable yet for having groups in. Um, but stay tuned. And I'm sure that as soon as we can get back in the studio, we'll be uh, letting everybody know. So as usual, uh, if you click the subscribe button and ding the bell, you should hear as soon as we've got something to say on that matter. But anyway, that's not what this is about tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about what I think has been the biggest change uh, to my photography in the last few years, and that includes changing camera systems. And I'm talking about the Pika 200 TTL, which is not focusing at all, because it's seeing my eyes. In fact, what I will do is we will swap camera angles and we will go, we'll switch over to the overhead view. So, um, about three years ago, I um, went to a photography show 
and I was lucky enough to, let's have myself on the screen as well, I was lucky enough to have some of the first of these flashes which came into the country. Um, this is from uh, Essential Photo, it's their Pixapro Pika 200 TTL. Uh, it's also uh, known in the US as the Adorama Flash Point, Flash Point, well, I can't even say it, Flash Point Evolve 200. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a Godox Witstro AD200. That's the manufacturer, and it's just rebadged for sale in various different places around the world. Um, I would always recommend that if you're buying them in the UK, that you do go to Pixapro um, because you get uh, great UK customer care. Um, if you go to Amazon and buy a Godox one, uh, it could be cheaper. They usually aren't. They're usually about the same price. But then I know people saying, well, but it's Amazon and you'll get supported by Amazon. Um, if it's a third party seller for Amazon, they normally pass the warranty issues back to that third party. And most of those are just Chinese resellers and it's not that easy to get somewhere with them. So stick with Pixapro if you can and go to Essential Photo. Um, but I did a video when I first bought them, which was, like I said, about three years ago. Going over the basics of the flash, um, what came in the box, um, how many shots you'll get from out of it, um, and um, how I intended to use it, basically. Um, I will put a link to that video, because it's still up on um, YouTube, but on my own personal channel, back in the uh, description once we've finished. Um, but at the end of the day, it's been three years now, and they really have altered the way that I go about taking my shots. And that's basically because this has also changed and evolved as well. I'll just go through. What I want to do is go through all the different options that come with it, and then I'll say about how I've been using it. So what we know is, what everybody knows is, that it, it's about the same power as three um, speed, uh, flash gun speed lights uh, from, say, Canon or Sony. Uh, so top of the range, one of those, uh, this will have about three times the power. Uh, out of the box, uh, you get the flash, uh, the battery and the charger. Um, you get the Fresnel head, which is the one which is like a normal speed light. You also get, out of, with it, um, the bare bulb head, which is here. So that's what you're looking at with the charger and a bracket out of the box. Um, what I've been doing is I've predominantly been, when I originally started, I was using the bare bulb um, when I was shooting uh, into a large modifier. Uh, one of, of course it takes, yeah, I'm going to fit this into a Bowens mount and then um, say it's a large soft box or a beauty dish, then this has, it's very much like a studio light. So, um, so I was using that for the large modifiers and then if I was just out with a small kit, then I would be taking the Fresnel head. Um, now what I haven't got here, but I have, because my, half my kit of course is in the studio, uh, is that what I'd normally be doing is I'd have a magmod attachment around the outside of the lens so that I could then put uh, various accessories on the front. And I've been shooting that way for a couple of years. Um, but they've also released a, a few other heads. Um, the first one which I... was an LED head which I haven't bought. Um, I don't really think that's, it's very small. It's only the same size as the Fresnel head. And I really don't think it's powerful enough to be much use for anything. Um, so the LED head I, I have avoided and that's the one I haven't bought. What I did buy was the um, head that allows you to put um, two of these bodies together and then have two bare bulbs so you get twice as much power out of it. If I just switch back to my, oops, wrong one, solo cam, and 
just go to show what I'm talking about, but I'm sure most of you already know anyway. Um, if we take the uh, off, so yeah, so what you see on the left is the two Pika 200s in the ADB2 head with two bulbs. Um, personally, I don't think you really need to use it that way much in the UK. Um, obviously, what we've got there is rather than 200 watt seconds of power, it's chucking out 400 watt seconds of power. The times I've been using it personally is when, say, if you look at the picture on the right, um, it is on the beach and soon after the midday sun in the height of summer, um, the, you can see from the shadows that the sun is behind her, so she is in shadow. But to actually compensate for it in those conditions, then I need more power than I'm going to get out of a single unit. Even Because even when you go to high speed sync, you're losing a lot of power. Um, but um, So that's the uh, dual head. Uh, I do have one. I can't actually show it at the moment because it's in the studio with a lot of my gear. Um, but anyway, let's switch back to me because I'm sure you can't wait to see me again. Um, right, so there we go. Um, let's turn that off. Um, right, so yeah, so the heads we've got so far we've talked about is the for now the LED, which I can see that Tony says that he does have the LED head. Um, and it assists with autofocus, but not much good for anything else. Yeah, you see, I think if you want to, I, I do have quite a lot of LED lights, uh, and there's quite a few around me at the moment, but they're bigger, um, and they're chucking out more power than what you get with something uh, this sort of size, So, uh, which I have to hold up in front of my eyes to focus on, which I should go back to the overhead shots. So let's go back to that, because I think that works a bit better. Um, Right, so so that was where we were. I'm using the Fresnel head um, for some shots. I'm using the bare bulb when I'm using the large modifiers. I'm using the dual head for going out on the beach in the hot summer days. Um, and, and I was happy with that, you know. Uh, I was getting multiple use from it. I've got, I picked up, I originally said start off with two of these. So I could either have uh, two units or maybe two of these, or uh, two like this. Um, I think actually, bear with me a moment, I will just, so what I was doing, I'm just gonna switch over to my desktop, which is here somewhere. Right, so what I was doing was uh, carrying them around in this hard case. Um, Oops, let's see if we can get me... Right, so there I am. Right, so um, I've got one 8200 with a bare bulb, second 8200 with a bare bulb. This one's just on its uh, Fresnel head. The other one is just with its Fresnel head. I've got the other two Fresnel heads here, both with the Magmod modifiers on. And then on either side, I've got um, Magmod spheres. So it's a, a quick and easy, put that head on the light, put a bang a, a sphere on it, and off you go. Um, ah, I see Michael said he picked up the ADB2 double head for just £35. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a great bit of kit, and at that price you can't complain about it. I'm presuming the person that was selling it was just not getting the use out of it. And like I said, I don't use it a lot, um, but it's there when I do need it, and I do need it occasionally. Um, but anyway, so this is how I was carrying the gear around. But recently, I'm not using these two other heads quite so much. So rather than using these two, I've been predominantly using this one, the round head. Um, because it's sort of a halfway house between the other two. So what I tend to do is I can put, I put this 
inside uh, a large modifier because there's an accessory kit. And with the accessory kit, it means I can actually do things in the studio or on location, which are very hard to do with a bare bulb. Now, okay, so what I'm talking about is, let's have a look at the accessory kit, which can get from all this. So they released along with the round head, uh, an accessory kit, which you can also use with their um, round head speed light. Um, now, most of what was in the accessory kit, uh, a lot of it I wouldn't use. So it comes with um, a snoot, which is very rubbish, uh, barn doors, um, um, a bounce card, uh, and none of that is anything I'd use. But I do use these. All right, so let's move those out of the way. Yeah, as Steve says, it's great to have the uh, extra power uh, that this offers us over a regular speed light. You know, speed lights are great, uh, but this isn't much difference in size. It's a bit heavier, but it gives you all the extra power you could want. Right, so let's click on the round head and have a look at what I do actually use. So it works in much the same way as my mag mods, except I don't have to put the bands around. Um, I have a grid and the grid just slots on. And now I have a gridded light, quick and easy. Um, also, if I put this inside a modifier and put the dome on, it gives a nice, even spread of light inside the modifier. So if I'm trying to fill a softbox, then this actually works really well. Um, obviously, I'm not getting quite as much power as I was getting from the bare bulb. So then I can see you saying, well, why, why would you use this rather than the bare bulb? Well, one thing is, it's a lot easier to transport. Um, I don't, when, one thing I would say is, don't keep taking the bulb in and out of the um, head. Because if you do, you have to wiggle it, and if the pins where it's actually all attached uh, are not very strong, and what you can do is you can actually detach the bulb from its base. So it's always best to leave a bulb in. So to keep it safe, you have to buy one of these, which only costs a few pounds. Um, but you know it it can it will it will keep this safe. So you just put it in, push it in, and then that'll keep it protected in your bag. But it's a hell of a lot easier just to put this in your bag and transport that, especially if you're going shooting overseas, which I've done a fair bit, and I'm pretty sure Gary has as well. So I don't know if he takes bare bulbs along with him when he's traveling as well. Um, but the other thing which I've been using a lot with this. Uh, is just this ring and you're thinking well why uh, I already owned gels from Rode and I can just take one of these gels out I can put it on the light it's now held in place by the magnet and if I put that on it's now going to spread that gelled light inside my modifier so that's an easy way to completely gel a large modifier. So when I was doing shots like, let's switch over. So shots like this were just using one of these lights with one of these on the back, pointing at the background behind the model, blasting the blue light everywhere. Um, this was, I think it's, uh, it was a Halloween shot we were doing uh, based on the first Purge, which is I think a TV series, was it on Sky? I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so it's a lot easier to gel that than it is to try and gel one of these. Now trying to gel this is can be a pain in the ass. Um, so it's much simpler and easier just to, oops, Put 
this little round thing here into there. It just it seem it feels like it's made for it because it's just the right size to all fit together. And of course, if you're not trying to spread the lights all out softly, you don't even need the dome. You can just leave the gel in like that. Um, so that is my reason for buying the accessory kit. They do do some gels, but to be honest, I think the round gels from Rogue, but I've started already owned them, uh, but I do think they're actually better than the gels you're getting from um, Godox themselves. Uh, so I'd always recommend doing that. Um, has anybody got any questions about what I'm talking about? Carrie's saying, did once my bare bulb 360 and ended up with an X bulb. Swooped just to speed lights after that before the Pika 200. Uh, right, yeah, the 360 is the same sort of thing. Uh, in actual fact, I think these caps are the same cap we had on the 360 as well. So I think they're the same ones. I think they're a bit big for the AD200 because I think the AD 360 bulbs were uh, slightly large, slightly longer. So, uh, all right. Yeah, the extension, right, let's talk about the, right, so I'll just go through what my kit was that I have been using. So, as I've shown before, I've got, I'm just using the basic lights, I've got the Fresnel head on the end, um, the Magmod, uh, I think it's called a Sphere, um, the strap, the clasp, um, the bag, they're all peak design, and I'll talk about peak design gear another day. Um, one of the things I have found using the Magmod and the Sphere, which would be exactly the same with the round head and the dome, is that it's great for the rain as well. Because what I can do is, I put a freezer bag here, and can put the whole of a flash in the freezer bag, and then the Sphere or the dome, just connects to it magnetically. So this is all waterproofed in a freezer bag. Um, I can stand the stand out in the rain. I'm probably going to be sheltering somewhere with my camera. The camera is weather sealed, but I don't like standing out in the rain myself. Um, and so it's completely protected from the elements. It doesn't generate that much heat. So it's usually okay to go ahead and leave in a freezer bag. As long as you're not machine gunning it, it, uh, it works quite well. And it's a small kit, you know, so this is just a, a small bag. Uh, I got a camera, probably got a spare lens in there. Um, this straps underneath. The camera clips on the side. Um, like I said, a very small kit just to take out for day shooting, basically. Um, the, what I will say though, is that if we go back to the AD, 200 dual head. There's a lot of weight on the top there. Uh, yeah, I'm still shooting Fuji. I, uh, uh, I've got rid of all my Canon stuff now, so I've got uh, several Fuji cameras. The uh, camera I'm using uh, to film me tonight, uh, let's just turn that back on again. Yeah, so this camera here, that's a Fuji XE3. Um, the overhead is just a webcam, um, but in the studio and when I'm out on location, it's a Fuji X-Pro2. Um, right, anyway, let's just turn that back to, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of weight here. Um, so it doesn't matter how strong your stand is, if you've got a large modifier on the top of there and you've got two of the um, Pika 200s, all, a lot of your weight is at the top and it can be a little unbalanced. So let's have a look at um, seeing what we've done about that. Um, so let's see. I've got some pictures of the other head in use somewhere. I can actually. Right, that's something else entirely. Ah, here we go. So, 
So right, so this isn't the dual head in use. Um, it's Mr. Bizit taking some pictures. Um, but as we were just talking about, uh, the light now is clamped to the bottom of the stand and a cable extension head is what goes up into the light modifier. So all of the weight is at the bottom of the stand, so it's not quite so top heavy. Um, I think uh, James uh, told me that um, he'd only had his uh, Pika 200 for a couple of weeks when it blew over and smashed. So he went straight went out and bought the extension cable instead. Um, I've got the extension cable. I don't tend to use it so much. Um, what I tend to do is have somebody else holding it for me. So, you know, in this shop, so this is one of our group shoots out in the car park. Um, I've got the 8200 in a small soft box on a stand, but I'm holding the stand. So if I, if I was shooting with um, somebody else, I'd be looking for them to hold the stand while I was while I was doing it. Um, but yeah, it said it, you you have to be careful with these things. Um, the, the other thing I would say, let's switch back to the view, is that okay? I'm I'm only talking here about the um, original AD two hundred. Um, but this panel on the back sits flush. Um, it's so easy to smash this panel. Um, I've got a couple of my AD 200s or Pika 200s, whatever you prefer calling them, have got cracks running straight away through the screen. Uh, it hasn't stopped them from working yet, they do still work, um, but that is an issue. Um, they are delicate, shall we say. So getting the weight of this light to the bottom of the stand and just having a cable which runs to the head uh, does make a lot of sense. I do have the cable, uh, so I don't use it a lot, uh, but once again, it's in the studio. So, <laughs> so I haven't got it with me at the moment. Um, but yeah, so especially if you're using the ADB2, um, then having um, two cables does make a lot of sense. Having said that, so I'm just going to have a sip. Um, you are starting to get quite expensive then, because you've got two lights, an ADB2, and you've got two extension cables. Uh, just having a look at the... Let's just have a look and see how much the extension cables go for. Well, there you go. So, you know, it's, it's £35.91 for one extension cable. So a couple of those is uh, £72. Um, so, you know, your costs are starting to mount up, even though it does save you uh, your lights. It keeps your lights safer and it does save you some money. Um, I've got a couple of um, neoprene covers for the um, for the units. Um, oops, let's go back to full screen, that's what I meant to do. So let's take that off and let's take these off. All right, and let's just pop back to the camera again, which is that one. Right. So yeah, so uh, just asked by Mark saying you seem to remember a rubber cover thing for the screen. Well, what I had was a whole neoprene jacket which would fit over the whole length of the light. Um, what James has done, if we go back to a picture of James, let's... yeah, this is probably going to show it better. Let's just switch to my desktop. So, whoops. What you see here, if I can zoom in, let's see. Yeah, it shows I don't use uh, Windows much to uh, go into things. But basically, James created his own foam end to his light to try and protect it a bit more. Um, oh, there we go. So yeah. So 
So what we've got there is something which uh, James knocked up himself, basically. Um, a little bit of foam over the end of his light um, just to protect it so that if it gets any damage, it knocks or anything, it doesn't uh, wreck his light and he can't use his lights. Um, like I said, I had veneerprene covers, but they didn't really seem to do a lot, so I don't tend to use them anymore. Uh, talking heavy bags, Dimitri and myself did a charity dance shoot with around 25 dancers and a light stand bag with a few tins of beans uh, to keep your, uh, yeah, your, your light stands down. Yeah, I'm just seeing what that comment was about. Um, I've also got um, another uh, case that this light will fit into. Uh, so you drop it into this case and then you can attach a strap to it. So what you do is your assistant has this on a strap um, around their uh, shoulder uh, with a remote head on the top. And then from there, the cable goes up to the light, which we're holding on a pole. Uh, what I've tended to do in the past is if we switch now back to me, um, I've had somebody assist. So if you see in this scene, let's turn me off. It wasn't that, it must be that. Right, so with this shot, um, the person uh, who came along as a chaperone um, was uh, holding the light, and I just got the, the light screwed in to the bottom um, on a little boom and a beauty dish on the end of the light. So yeah, if there's somebody with you, yeah, get them to hold the light for you. They're not that whole, uh, heavy. Um, gazebo weights, which you fill with water. Yeah, yeah. There's, you know, there's various different things you can get, um, which you can put around the base of a light stand to hold the light stand down. But at the end, end of the day, it's also better to try and keep the, all of the weight at the bottom of the light rather than the top of the light. Um, it's um, um, just a precaution, isn't it? Um, I've had a few knocks, but so far I've been lucky and nothing's actually been um, completely destroyed. So, uh, you know, I'm not the best at being careful with my kit, that's for sure. Um, right, what else did we have to go through? Triggers. Um, now, the original, if you uh, want to fire the camera, then your, then your options, of course, would be either to use a speed light, another speed light as a controller, um, or uh, the uh, Godox X1T. Now, this doesn't work very well for me because um, the trouble with this is that my camera, the uh, Fuji X Pro 2, has, it's mostly controlled by dials and the dials are on the top plate of the camera. And this trigger covers up my ISO dial and my shutter speed dial. So I can't actually see them to see what I'm actually turning and what I'm setting it to. So this trigger was something I used at the beginning because it was all that was there, but I don't use very often. What we tend to use, if I just switch back to the overhead shot. Um, yeah, so what we tend to use in the studio, we'll, uh, we'll use these. It's a simple manual trigger. Um, we can use this both for our AD200. Um, I'm not sure how many AD200s we've actually got in the studio because uh, there's four for myself and Dimitri's got several as well. So we've got quite a few of AD200s in there. But this will control all of those and it will also control our studio lights. Now you don't get any fancy um, um, systems like HSS or TTL metering. Uh, it is just all manual. But for the stuff we're doing in the studio, that's fine. Um, for my own stuff, I tend to use one of these, which is the uh, X Pro trigger. Now, or as uh, Pixapro call it, the ST4 in Roman, Roman numerals. Uh, the only thing with both the this Pro trigger 
and the XT1 trigger I showed you beginning is that you need to find the model for your brand of camera because they'll produce one for Canon, one for Nikon, one for Fuji, one for um, Olympus, Panasonic, uh, one for Sony. Uh, and that's because it does control all the uh, TTL and HSS. Um, these manual triggers, uh, they're literally just using the center pin. So they will work with any camera which has a center pin. And yes, I'm looking at you, Canon, for your cameras, which no longer have center pins, which is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I recommend this. Not only does it have a nice large display, um, but it does have a large foot, keeps it away from the top plate of a camera, um, and it's nice and nice big buttons, nice big dial, easy to use. Um, it's very similar to the um, the display you get on the back and buttons you get on the back of actually using a flash as a trigger. Um, now, the advantage of using the X1T is, of course, that you've got a pass-through hot shoe. So, as well as using this to trigger your off-camera flash, you can use the uh, pass-through uh, to put something else on top. What I have seen is people stacking triggering systems. So they'll have the X1T for triggering their Godox lights, and then they'll put a Yongnyo trigger on top, and they'll have a couple of Yongnyo speed lights, and they'll use you know the stacked trigger on top uh, to fire those as well. So you can have a mixed system where you've got some lights from one manufacturer and some lights from another. Um, it works, you know. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, if you want a bit of on camera flash as well as off camera, then obviously you're better off going for one of the uh, speed lights to do your triggering both of on camera and off camera. Just reading what's coming up on the messages. Uh, I think the new Flashpoint version of that trigger has illuminated buttons. Yeah, it, Flashpoint commissioned their own trigger, which is unfortunately only available to them. Um, you can't, if you want to buy it, you'd have to buy it from Flashpoint. And not only is it quite expensive, but you also get stung for import tax if you bring it into the country. So, um, yeah, not great. Um, it's, it's just, you know, that's how it is. Um, now, whether Pixel Pro could um, spec out their own version of triggers, possibly. It'd be, it'd be interesting if they could do. Um, Michael likes the TCM function on the X Pro trigger. So that's where um, you start off with um, taking a TTL shot, and then you click on the, you know, you take, you put it on TCM, you take a shot that's TTL, and then you can adjust those shots, uh, those uh, settings, uh, manual settings. So the TTL puts you in the ballpark of where the light should be. Um, and then you can tweak it uh, manually afterwards. Um, now for some reason, I'm stopped getting uh, chat coming through in OBS. But uh, anyway. Um, just catching up on the comment on the comments and questions. Yeah, nice to switch modeling light on and off so you get an idea of shadows and then switch it off so you don't generate lots of heat. Yeah, always good. Uh, I don't tend to use modeling lights a lot myself, but um, it is a good idea to let you know exactly where the light's going to be falling. Um, I haven't got a lot else to say. I was going to say, but i um, just going to show you some more examples of um, what else you can do. So, like I said, you know, I, I'm using the system now predominantly with um, um, these as my modifiers uh, and grids and gels. Um, but I still do use mag mods from time to time, which is why I've got them in the studio. Um, if we look at the desktop at the moment, so if you see this shot and you can see these lines going through here, that was using a magmod beam 
to beam light against the wall to create patterns and shapes and uh, various other of interest. So uh, in the studio here, I've got one um, AD200 or Pika 200 on the background, another Pika 200 lighting our model from this side, and then a third Pika 200 just as a fill light on the other side of the image. Um, just because their replacement for speed lights doesn't mean we don't use them in the studio. I tend to use these in the studio more than I do with our big studio lights. Um, one of the reasons being that I'm just a lot more familiar with them because I use them a lot. Um, but another reason being that um, uh, they are quite flexible. And that's what I love about them. And that's why I've got four, because I can uh, mix and match and do various different things. Like I said, one of these is in a big modifier. One of them is in a mag mod. And one of them is in a small, uh, harsh mod more harsh modifier on the other side. So, uh, and they're all small, easy to use. There's no cables traipsing around the studio. And you get 500 shots at full power. Um, I hardly ever shoot at full power. Um, you don't really need to most of the time. Um, have we got any other questions? Because I can see that I've been wittering on now for quite a while. Uh, we've done three quarters of an hour here. So <laughs> uh, um, if anybody does have questions about the Pika 200s or um, Godox AD200 or Evolve 200, whichever system you want to call it, um, please get in touch. If you want to uh, see how they work or whatever, once we're back in the studio, come along and I'll be happy to give anybody a demonstration of what we do with them. Um, just reading other comments now. Uh, Tony is saying on the last 24 hour shoot, I use one on a boom arm for directly over the top of the model like a spotlight because it was easier than putting a full studio light absolutely um i tend to use these a lot just because i want a big beauty dish up high on a big boom and it's a lot easier putting one of these up on a, on a stand than it is one of our big um sk 300s up there um uh, and dimitri saying that our next uh, little chat will be with steve so that's something to look forward to i'm not sure steve knows that yet <laughs> so, but like I said, we're hopefully going to do these a little bit more frequently. Um, I can't talk more than about 45 minutes because uh, that's when I start wearing out and having to take a little bit of a rest. But um, thank you very much for anybody stopping by today. Um, if anybody does uh, re watch this video later um, and hasn't had a chance to ask questions in the chat, then please put them on the comments to the video and one of us will hopefully get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Um, as I said at the beginning, please do subscribe so you know when we're going to be online. Some of it, like I said, will be uh, Q and A's. Some of it will be just going through some gear. Some of it will be showing a demonstration of a particular skill. Uh, and some of it will just be me sitting at a computer editing my photos. Um, so <laughs> pick and choose what you want to watch. Um, but ring the notification bell and then you'll be told when one of us is going online. But apart from that, thank you very much everybody for watching and hopefully we'll see you again next time. Cheers for now. <laughs>